So hello everybody, welcome back to the Igneous Petrology series. So now we're in lesson three and we're going to be looking at Gibbs phase rule. Okay. So Gibbs phase rule identifies the degrees of freedom in a system using the number of components and the number of phases in that system. So in more simple words, it tells us how many intensive variables must be defined to work out the state of the system. The rule was first proposed by American scientist J.W. Gibbs in a series of works published between 1875 and 1878. So just some definitions for you. Degrees of freedom, often denoted as F, is the number of independent variables needed to define a system. The number of components, denoted as C, is the number of components existing in the system. And number of phases, or denoted as P, is the number of phases existing in the system. So when we talk about parameters, we're talking about either intensive or extensive parameters. Intensive parameters are those that do not scale with the system, so they are not proportional to the system. Good examples of intensive parameters include temperature and pressure. So just because a system is either bigger or smaller, it doesn't mean the temperature has to increase or decrease. Other examples of intensive parameters include density and composition and we're going to explore those more in upcoming presentations on phase diagrams. In contrast, extensive parameters are those that do scale with the system. So in other words, these are parameters that are proportional to the system. Good examples of these include volume and mass. So the bigger a system is, the bigger its volume is, right? They scale. Other examples include things like entropy and enthalpy, and we'll cover those in different presentations. So what is the rule? What is Gibbs phase rule? So here is an outline of Gibbs phase rule where we have the degrees of freedom denoted by F is equal to the number of components minus the number of phases plus a constant, which is 2 in Gibbs phase rule. So now we're going to look at a phase diagram of water and I'm going to give a really simple example of the Gibbs phase rule in action. So along the X axis we have temperature and along the Y axis we have pressure and this dashed line represents one atmospheric pressure with a crossover point at 1 degree Celsius as well. So just to make this diagram a little bit easier to comprehend, in this portion here we have ice, which is separated by its melting point from water. So water exists in this field here, which is then separated from vapour by its boiling point. Okay, And then up here we have things like supercritical fluids, but we don't need to really worry about that today. So imagine a system represented by this red dot, which is currently sitting in the ice field. That red dot can exist anywhere in that light blue field. Anywhere in that light blue field, it is one component, so H2O, and one phase, ice. So if you put that into Gibbs phase rule of F equals C minus P plus 2, we have one component, H2O, one phase, ice, plus 2, which is equal to 2. So that means we need to define two intensive variables to know where that dot is located on this phase diagram. This is also known as a divariant system. So for example, if we have one atmospheric pressure, the, in the ice field it can exist at any of these temperatures. So we would need to define both pressure and temperature to know the state of the system. As we reach the melting point of the ice, what happens is we still have a one component system, H2O, but we now have two phases, ice and water, that exist anywhere along this line, the symbol is melting point. So now we still have one component, which is our H2O, but we have two phases. So that means we have one degrees of freedom, or also known as a univariant system. So what that means is at one atmospheric pressure, we know the temperature. Okay, So it has to be a certain temperature at that one pressure. So these variables then become codependent. So if we increase that pressure, the temperature would decrease according to this melting point line. As we continue to heat that, we then go into a divariant field of water again, so just like we had in ice before. And now we start to boil the water. Okay, So now we're getting steam off the water, and again, we go into another univariant system where we have one component and two phases, where if we define the pressure, we know what the temperature is. So i.e. at one atmospheric pressure, if we're boiling water in a kettle, it boils consistently at 100 degrees Celsius until it is entirely vapour. Okay. Now, as we go down to what's known as this triple junction here, what we have is we have all the components in one system. We have water, steam, and ice. 
Okay, so one component still, H2O, but now we have three phases. So what that means is we have no degrees of freedom. We have what's then known as an invariant system, where it's fixed at a certain pressure and a certain temperature and doesn't change. Another one component system I advise you to check out is that of quartz. And if you look at that phase diagram, you can apply the same rules we've learned today. So have a go at that. Place a red dot onto anywhere on that system, characterize it by Gibbs phase rule, and learn a little bit more about the system. If you found this helpful, please stay in the loop by clicking subscribe. Drop any comments or queries in the comment box below. Thank you.